Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sonia Berthasel. I'm a member of the Maine Climate and Ag Network, or MECAN, and one of the organizers of this webinar series. I'd like to thank the Forest Climate Change Initiative for helping to support this series. Uh, MECAN is simply a network of scientists, outreach professionals, and stakeholders coordinated by, through the University of Maine, and our mission is to increase communication and identify challenges, opportunities, and potential solutions regarding climate and agriculture. This is the second in a series of three webinars. Um, we hope you'll check out our website for a recording of our last installment on the changing landscape of soil health and look for information about how to sign up for the next installment on climate change and on-farm water management coming up in a couple of weeks. You can find all those details at the same website where you registered for this webinar, presumably, umaine.edu slash climate dash ag slash webinars. Uh, without further ado, let's get right to today's topic, which is pasture management in a changing climate. I am delighted, delighted to be joined by a wonderful panel of speakers. Each will give a 10 to 12-ish minute talk, which should leave plenty of time for question and answer and discussion in the latter part of the session. People who are not presenting, I would ask to stay muted um, while presentations are happening. And please hold uh, verbal questions until the question and answer period at the end. But if you have burning questions um, as talks are happening, you can type them in the chat and I'll store them for later. I'll offer a brief introduction to each speaker before their talk, starting today with C. Allen Rotz. Um, Dr. Al Rotz is an agricultural engineer with USDA ARS. His work has included development of the Integrated Farm Systems Model, or IFSM, and sustainability analysis of beef and dairy production and adaptation of farming systems to climate change. He has decades of experience working with the East Lansing Cluster of the U.S. Dairy Forage Research Center and the Pasture Systems and Watershed Management Research Unit in University Park, Pennsylvania. Really a wealth of experience and I'm so excited to learn from him today. Take it away, Al. Thank you. Um, I can get my screen shared. Are we on? Good. Well, I'm going to begin today just with a little background on climate change, particularly in the Northeast, as it relates to the Northeast, and then go on to talk about how it affects agriculture, and then with some specifics on, on pasture and grazing. And I'll begin with uh, some pretty basic information here, hopefully not too basic, but I want to talk about I guess, defining weather and climate. And weather is what we sort of experience daily. We sense the temperature, we see rain and so forth. And it's very variable and it's really hard to detect change because of the high variability. But when we track rather weather over long-term um, records and get look at long-term averages and trends, uh, that's how we really observe climate change. And based on our long-term data, climate is changing, generally becoming more variable, generally warmer temperatures and changes in precipitation. Uh, this, this is a, an illustration of, of temperature change over the past century in the United States. You can see the dark red areas where most of the change is occurring. So some of the Southeast isn't changing all that much, but particularly when we get up into the Northeast and Maine, um, we are experiencing uh, warmer temperatures. In general, the higher you go north in the, on the globe, the more change you're experiencing. So in particular, in the Northeast, over the past century, there's a, a very definite trend that, that there's been about an increase of three degrees Fahrenheit in our average annual temperature. With warmer temperatures, our grazing season, our growing season is increasing. Some of our data here in central Pennsylvania indicates that, that uh, over the past 20, 30 years, we've been increasing uh, our um, growth uh, periods about 
nine days per de decade, which is almost a, a day per year, which is incredible. Uh, if we look at annual precipitation, uh, in general, when you look across the country, the drier areas are getting drier and the wetter areas are getting wetter. So in the Northeast, uh, precipitation in general is increasing. If we look at the trend over the past century, you can see it's very variable, but in general, it's looking like we're getting about a 10% increase compared to uh, a century ago. But that's only part of the story. Storm intensity is increasing greatly, particularly in the Northeast, uh, as you see here, more extreme rainfalls. Our carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere is, is increasing. Um, and I guess most are familiar with that and it's primarily driven by the burning of fossil fuels. This is driving a lot of the weather change. It's also affecting crops though, because as we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, that can stimulate growth of certain crops, particularly forage crops. So in summary, I guess the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration is increasing. This has an effect on crops. Ambient temperatures are gradually increasing, variability in temperature is increasing, and the variability and amount of precipitation is increasing, particularly in the Northeast. So what does this mean for farming? Well, really there's no drastic changes. Uh, recent trends will continue and likely the rate of change will increase a bit. So to, to get a better look, let's look into the future and see what that looks like. And to do this, we use models. We're working with a number of different uh, climate models. These are process-based models that really look at the, the detailed uh, you know, relationships and, and processes that are going on within our uh, atmosphere and how it relates to land and water changes and so forth. But it, these models, there's many of them all over the world and we've selected some of the better ones. We're working with nine different ones here that I'll be showing you data from. So these models have been kind of verified against historical data and we're using them now to project, project what's going to happen in the future. So this is some data from Maine. If we look at southern Maine, you can see that the temperature is projected to increase, you know, five degrees Fahrenheit uh, just over the next 30 years or so, with a couple more degrees maybe towards the end of the century. And this depends a lot on how our emissions of greenhouse gases uh, evolve. The error bars here show the variability among our climate models. So there is some variability, but the trend is definitely clear. And it's projecting similar changes across all uh, periods of the year. This is a look at Northern Maine. It looks very much the same kind of trends, uh, a little lower temperatures, but same kind of temperature differences, increases projected. Another way of looking at this, is uh, how our, how the, the the past climate, I guess, compares to current climate and projected climate. So the white mane up at the top represents last century's uh, temperature conditions. The yellow indicates what uh, the climate is moving towards for Maine with a lower emission scenario. That just means if we can get some control over the greenhouse gas emissions that were emitted, the red shows if, if we're not going to make much change. So it's a little busy, but I guess generally what it's showing, what it illustrates is that uh, if with business as usual and our emission levels, the climate of Maine that, that we'll be experiencing throughout the, the mid to later century will be similar to what I grew up with in Southern Pennsylvania. As far as precipitation, uh, it's also projected to increase a little bit. You can see the error bars here, a lot of variability between climate models, some actually projecting decreases, but most projecting increases and overall the average is, is increasing. Not a lot, but maybe a couple inches, uh, a few inches per year. And again, it's kind of spread pretty evenly throughout the seasons, although it's projecting a little bit more increase in the winter months than other parts of the year. Northern Maine's very much the same kind of trend. A lot of variability, 
and a little bit more projected for the winter than the other seasons. So how's this gonna affect our crops and pasture? Uh, increasing atmospheric CO2, as I indicated, stimulates growth in many crops, particularly forage crops. So we can expect, and we probably have already received some increase in forage yields due to the warming temperatures and longer growing season. Increasing temperatures can promote growth of some crops, interfere with others, uh, particularly corn grain, we find that at least the models project that increasing temperatures could actually reduce corn grain yields in our region and um, it may be similar up there. Uh, of course, the growing season is increasing, as I indicated, and that's, that's of course a benefit. Increasing precipitation may be of some benefit, but the increasing temperatures is increasing evapotranspiration, which will probably offset a lot of the potential benefit from increased precipitation. This is a look at what the, our models project as, as yields of crops here in uh, central and southern Pennsylvania. So I'm not quite sure how this might apply, but I guess in general, it applies to, to your conditions. But you can see forage crops like alfalfa are benefiting, yields increasing, and there's some variability, particularly as we get close to the end of the century. Corn silage, not a lot of change, but maybe a slight increase. Corn grain, probably a decrease in projected yields. Wheat, not much change. Soybean, maybe a small increase. Another benefit with the longer growing season is double cropping. And this is becoming increasingly popular in, in our area, whether it and how much it impacts your conditions in Maine, I guess is to be determined. I did do some simulations of pasture yields for Maine. And this is what, what I found uh, for what it's worth, I guess. A lot of variability being predicted among the different climate models. Um, and an average overall, I mean, some are projecting decreases, some are projecting increases, overall average, not much change. As we moved more towards Northern Maine though, the models were predicting more consistent increases in, in yield or productivity of pastures. These simulations were done with an orchard grass and white clover type pasture species. Uh, and this may be changing. And I guess one of the things I was just going to point out here was perennial ryegrass. We're finding them throughout uh, pastures in the Northeast, but fairly low amounts. But some work by my colleague Sarah Gosley and projecting in the future with some models that she has indicates that uh, as a dark darker green implies as we move throughout the century, species like perennial ryegrass, which is very high quality pasture grass, will actually become more, more dominant in the pastures. So there's a lot of positives in this, but there are some negatives, not maybe so much for pastures, but for other crops, particularly the model winters and longer growing season uh, do, does tend to promote uh, more weed growth and more insect damage and that sort of thing. So we have to consider that too as we move and, and adapt to the future. So in summary, I guess the changes in climate are affecting crop growth and, and pasture in the Northeast. Uh, we have experienced some change already. We're gonna experience more. And to adapt and make, take benefit basically of our climate change, we're gonna have to make some management changes in planning and harvesting dates of crops, maybe some crop genetics, uh, that sort of thing. Particularly for pastures, you know, the growing season's increasing, which should, should be a good benefit. Uh, we'll likely see some changes in our pasture species. Some will be just natural selection, others might be changes in, in the crops we want to establish for our pasture crops. So with that, that's what I have to present now and look forward to the further discussion. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Al. I, really fun to see some main specific data there. Thanks for sharing that. And I know there are several people uh, among us who are quite interested in crop modeling and look forward to more discussion and question and answer um, at the end. 
But up next, um, I am delighted to introduce Leah Puro, um, who is the Agricultural Research Coordinator at Wolf's Neck Center for Agriculture and the Environment in Freeport, Maine. Leah coordinates the on-farm research trials and works with Open Team, which stands for Open Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management, which is a project to test open source technologies that provide farmers with knowledge to improve soil health um, and sort of helps translate that into programming. So uh, I know Leah has had a little bit of a spotty internet connection today, but is with us, hooray, and we, we hope that that continues to be the case. Take it away, Leah. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, Sonia, I can't share my screen anymore. Oh, let me remake you a co-host now that you have thanks. joined our session. This is a thing we can do. There, you should be good to go. Lovely, thank you so much. Cool. Um, so as Sonia mentioned, I'm the Ag Research Coordinator here at Wolfsnick Center um, for Agriculture and the Environment in Freeport, Maine. And so today we're going to talk about some research we have going on on Wolfsnick more broadly, um, and then really dive into our work in, on in-field soil health assessments through one of our research projects. So just for those of you who, do, uh, who don't know, um, a little bit about Wolfsnick Center. Um, we are a nonprofit organic dairy and vegetable farm. We have a public production farm, an educational center, a research center, and a camping ground, making the farm quite a bustling tourist destination, as well as a functional farm. Um, so our management practices on the farm reflect these multi-layered goals of the operation. We started our dairy production in 2015, and prior to that, we had beef cattle on the property. Um, right now, we have about 30 milking cows, 25 dry cows, and heifers that comprise our total herd. We also have a dozen sheep and goats, uh, some laying hens and broilers in the summer, and some pigs as well. Um, we're home to a vegetable apprenticeship program and also host dairy apprentices through the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program, as we believe that inspiring and training young farmers is integral to our agricultural and food systems. So over the last two years, we've been really building up our research project portfolio, investing in equipment to conduct research on agricultural practices that can hold up in the face of unpredictable weather patterns and climate change. So some of these research projects that we're working on, um, one of them is the bovine burp buster project, which is called the V3 project. Um, and this is an animal feed trial that explores the relationship between a supplemental seaweed in the cow diet to reduce enteric methane emissions. So as part of this project, we're measuring methane emissions through burps using this green feed system, um, milk production per animal per day, milk quality, blood samples, and fecal samples. We're deep in that project right now. We're about halfway through that. Um, and our second project is a summer forages project. periods. Um, and so we're just using low till methods to minis minimize our disruption to the soil ecosystem. I also just got a notification that my internet's unstable. So can everyone still hear me? Yeah, we lost you for <laughs> about 30 seconds there. So you might want to um, jump back up and uh, repeat some of what you said about the summer forages project. Oh, okay, great. Um, so it's just a demonstration plot of summer forages that were established using minimum tillage me methods. And the purpose is just to explore forage season extension and forage quality during the hot and dry periods in the summer. Um, and then our last project, which is where we'll focus the rest of the time today, or my time today, <laughs> um, is Open Team, which stands for Open Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management. And it's a farmer-driven interoperable platform built to support farmers around the world with the best possible knowledge to improve soil health. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so who we are, who is Open Team? The Open Team community is a collaborative community of farmers, scientists, and researchers, engineers, farm service providers, 
and large food companies that are committed to building open source tools to overcome the challenges most farmers face when it comes to adaptive soil health management. Um, so here are just some of our partners that we're working with, but we are expanding on a weekly basis at this point. Um, and what we do, so we're creating a technological ecosystem and social community to support data interoperability for better soil health insights for farmers, ranchers, researchers, food companies, and other stakeholders. So what we offer is field level carbon measurement, digital management records, remote sensing, predictive analytics, um, and input and economic management decision support in a connected platform that reduces the need for manual data entry and simultaneously approves access to a wide array of tools. Um, we support adaptive soil health management for farms of all scales, geographies, and production types, and are working to accelerate scientific understanding of soil health by providing more high quality data to researchers collaborating on this project. Um, and so this slide is sort of just to demonstrate that there are many different ag tech tools and ag softwares out there, as I'm sure most of you know, um, but none of them are really able to connect. And so the goal of Open Team is to create an ecosystem of technology tools for farmers in which data can flow through an entire ecosystem, making it so farmers only have to enter data once and can use that data in multiple ways. And so an example of that would be entering and having a place for your management data, just so you know what you've done on the field and having that data flow very easily to an organic certifier, or then having that be able to flow to you know, your supply chain um, so that you can use that data in multiple ways. So I've used some jargon and I just wanna go over it pretty quickly. Um, so what is a technology ecosystem, right? Uh, a technology ecosystem is a complex network or interconnected system. So just as a natural ecosystem, it's a as is a community of organisms that are linked through nutrient flows. What we call a technology ecosystem is a community of tools and technologies that are linked through data flows. Um, what is open source? Open source is a publicly accessible software design that can be modified and shared by multiple users. So this allows the source code to be inspected and enhanced by anyone. And it allows for more control, increased security and stability, and additional training opportunities for developers and users. Um, what is data interoperability? Uh, interoperability is a characteristic of a product or system whose interfaces are completely understood to work with other products or systems in the present or in the future um, without any restrictions. So it just allows data to flow from one software to another on the back end without re-entering the data from the user's perspective. And so Open Team engages a diversity of developers, organizations, and farmer groups who share a common belief in open sharing and collaboration. The ecosystem includes remote sensing technologies, agroecosystem models to track whole farm emissions and environmental impacts, decision tools to assist with on the ground management implementation, adaptive management farmer networks, um, and observational tools and record keeping tools. Um, and so the goal of this interoperability allows farmers to enter their data once and then send it to another, another place. So for some of these two, if you have an observational tool or a management data tool, you can enter that in and it can go to an agro ecosystem model tool that can help you track your greenhouse gas emissions over time or something like that. Um, and a lot of that, and we'll, you know, we're moving into an environment where people are starting to get paid for their carbon. Um, and so that could really allow for easy data flow into those systems for farmers to not have to think too much about it. And so then how we work, um, Open Team has five working groups to achieve these goals of interoperability. Um, our first working group is the tech working group. And this was our primary focus for year one of the project. We're currently in year two of the project. Um, and the technology team identifies opportunities for co-development, prioritizing work packages, and supports interoperability of technologies. So we have multiple technology companies that are all coming together to solve problems that the farms, farmers that we're working with bring to the table. Um, our second working group is the field methods working group, which is the closest to, to my work. Um, 
And so we bridge the science with the available tech tools to create an approach that will support the needs of farmers, ranchers, researchers, and markets. Uh, we're currently working on a research question and protocol library and decision tool to help farmers and ranchers choose in-field soil health assessments that fit within their research or monitoring needs. Um, then we have the Hub and Network Working Group, and this group grounds and coordinates the other working groups um, throughout scales, geographies, production systems, through farmer, rancher, research, and market networks. So these are like boots on the ground, the farms that are actually using these tools and providing feedback to us to help us improve them. Um, we have a system-centered design working group, and that's focused on creating internal and external social feedback and design processes for the open team community. So they take the feedback from those hub and network groups and they translate it in a way that the tech working group can understand and uh, make work packages based on that. And then our last and newest working group is our racial equity and inclusion working group, um, which works to amplify the work of our members and support collaborative efforts towards racial equity and inclusion through open team community members. And these are just some benefits um, of open team that, that we see. Um, a shared ag tech toolkit for farmers, field technicians, agronomists, and others, rapid and low cost in field assessment tools, greater farmer control over their data, which is a huge one, um, data portability to value added incentives, such as certification, conservation payments, ecosystem service credits, um, a peer-to-peer -peer learning based on affinities, so based on production type, scale, um, or in research interests, and a way to measure conservation practice effectiveness. And so I just wanted to highlight a few of the tools that we're working with. Um, so one of them is LAM PKS, and this is free mobile phone app connected to cloud-based storage. Um, it follows the NRCS in-field soil health assessment to provide farmers with the observational tools that they need to assess the health of their soils and plants in the field without sending any samples off for analysis. So it's actually a really great, easy tool to just like get an understanding of your soil type, your soil texture, um, how water flows across your landscape. It has tools to help you identify plant species and plant species composition. Um, so I highly recommend checking this one out. Um, FarmOS is a little bit more detailed, so this is a web-based application for farm management, planning, and record keeping, developed by a community of farmers, developers, and researchers. Um, and then there's a field kit portion of this that you can use on your phone offline and upload to the cloud. And then the last one is SurveyStack, and this is a research platform that cre creates surveys or research protocols to make sure that you're collecting standardized data in the field year after year or project to project. And then I just wanted to share an example with you of these tools in action and how we're using them this year. Um, so the Field Methods Working Group um, is creating this decision support tool and research library. Um, and the purpose of this um, is to help farmers, ranchers, and researchers with asking the right questions based on what they what their research interests are, so what they will need to measure and how they want to measure it. Um, and so we're currently working on this decision support tool while combing through different soil health assessment methodologies to take note of considerations that must be taken into account when choosing the correct method for each project. This decision support tool would recommend protocols based on a profile created by the user so that a user doesn't have to enter in their information every time they're seeking uh, methodology decision support. So an example of this would be us at Wolf's Next Center, right? We're a nonprofit educational and research arm in Maine. Um, so a lot of our soil work is used for demonstration and teaching our community about agriculture and soil health. However, we have all of these focused research projects that I mentioned earlier, in which we need to use more rigorous methods for soil health quantification. So I would fill out a survey using one of our tools, survey stack, and at the high level, it would probably recommend that I do more demonstration-based protocols, but at a project level, 
the tool would recommend that I do some more specific protocols. And so the idea here is that when farmers are looking to see which sorts of protocols and methods they should use for their soils, we can start to standardize that data collection and we can start to compare a little bit more. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of where we're headed with our field methods group. And I feel like that's probably the most relevant for this group in terms of where we're at. So thank you. Well, thank you, Leah. As someone who has personally a soft spot for decision support tools, I've really enjoyed hearing about what you're up to at Wolf's Neck and um, hope that folks have uh, questions about some of your other projects that we can get to later on in the program. But for now, I'd invite you to stop sharing your screen and we can head on over yeah. to Sam's presentation. So Dr. Sam Corcoran is the Southern New England Project Coordinator for the New England Grazing Network in partnership with the Livestock Institute. She is also a postdoc at UMass Amherst conducting on-farm soil health research with dairy farmers in partnership with American Farmland Trust. And I am so excited to learn about this uh, basketball metaphor and uh, more, more about pasture management. Go right ahead, Sam. Great, thank you. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. Um, if you don't like basketball, luckily, as I said to Sonia at the beginning, it's only 12 minutes. Um, but so for the uninitiated to follow along this presentation, you're gonna have to know what the pick and roll play is. So we're gonna start by watching tape because this metaphor is gonna stick with us throughout. Um, so what I'm gonna show you here is a clip of Steve Nash and um, Amari Stoudemire, who played on the Phoenix Suns in the early 2000s, and they were famous for executing the pick and roll over and over and over and just driving the defensive teams nuts. So what you're going to see here, oh, let me get my, uh, my laser pointer. <laughs> cool. So what you're going to see here is uh, Steve Nash, who is the point guard. He is going to be driving the ball to the hoop. And then you see Stoudemire. Oh, let's go back. Um, you see Stoudemire set up what's called the pick. So here is Stoudemire. It won't let me use my laser pointer on the um, video. But at any rate, uh, Stoudemire is up here at the top of the key, and he has set the pick. Steve Nash is being guarded by the defensive player. He's going to run around Stoudemire and the defensive player is gonna get tripped up. This is gonna create the opportunity for Stoudemire to now roll to the basketball hoop, Nash to pass in the ball, and Stoudemire can score. So it's gonna happen fast, um, but let's watch. Steve Nash rolls around, passes, Stoudemire rolls to the hoop. So here it is again, sets up the pick, rolls to the hoop, makes the basket. So that's the primary outcome of this play. Pick, roll, get the pass, shoot the ball. Sometimes the other outcome of this play is that Stoudemire might get to the hoop and he might see that now he's being guarded and he can't actually receive the pass. But the point guard might find that this play has now made him open so he can shoot the ball. So that's the alternative outcome. Um, let me tell you why this relates to pasture renovation. Let me get rid of my laser pointer. Um, so the point here is that a good play does not have to be difficult. So as I mentioned, they're famous for running this play, but this is one of the first plays that kids learn in like rec league basketball, as I obviously did and have remembered 20 years later. Um, and it's a similar idea with pasture renovation. The effectiveness of pasture renovation is in the simplicity. You just got to run the steps of the play. And when we do this, we can actually score points against climate change. So when we're thinking about pasture renovation, our first steps are getting our pH under control, our fertility under control, and dealing with weed management. This is Stoudemire setting up the pick and the roll. This is always the first step of the play. And sometimes that allows you to score. But sometimes what happens is you find out, well, I set up the play, but I still need to come in and reseed. That's like Nash finding that he can't pass the ball and he has to shoot. It's, it's, an, it's a variation on the play, but you always start by setting up the pick and roll. You always start by dealing with your fertility, your pH, and your weeds. 
So when we're playing a game, we have to know who our opponent is. And Al already really introduced us to this. Um, but so some of the predictions that came out in 2007 for Maine were these winter and summer temperature increases, that precipitation events were going to be more intense, um, aka more damaging. Uh, and that there probably wasn't going to be an increase to summer precipitation. And so that coupled with warmer summers, as Al mentioned, that evapotranspiration means more and longer drought periods. Now, the governor's 2020 uh, climate report does say that they're now uncertain whether drought conditions will become more or less likely. But when drought conditions do develop, they are going to be exacerbated by all of these other climatic factors going on around them. And we know that temperature and precipitation uh, really affect the quality and the quantity of pasture, especially since our cool season grasses, you know, like their roots to be in 55 to 60 ish um, is a sweet spot for their, their, their good growth. So the other part of our opponent that we have to keep in mind is how we manage our own team. And poor pasture management can lead to the loss of soil carbon. And when we degrade our soil carbon, it's like overworking our best player at practice and injuring them before they ever get to the big game. So when you lose soil carbon, there's tons of consequences. It affects our microbial communities, our fertility, and then of course the yield of pastures. Things like water infiltration and water holding capacity, which are of course gonna be super important when we have these more intense rainfall events. And it also affects our long-term drought resilience. And so we want to be able to hold on to the water that we get when we have these rain events. Soil carbon also has some physical characteristics for your soil as well as your stand. And then that's going to affect the ability of your pasture to withstand repeated animal traffic when they're grazing. And of course, all of this ultimately affects the farmer's profitability. So I think the first thing we have to keep in mind is that a game has two elements. There's defense and there's offense. And when I think about pasture, I think about pasture as our defensive strategy. So we know in the literature that there's tons of studies that show that converting our land to pasture can store more carbon than in our annual systems. So there's uh, this one paper from 2017 and they looked at a pasture system versus a no-till system that used silage corn. And they found that under pasture, those fields stored about 24% more carbon than a no-till system. In terms of milk production, they also found that for every uh, pound of stored carbon under pasture, there was 15% more milk produced compared to every pound of carbon under um, these annual systems. So it's, it's good for the soil, but it's good for the milk too. So here's that defensive play again. This is from a paper that looked at about 175 different studies and was trying to figure out how do different pasture management strategies affect soil carbon. So here's our defensive strategy, converting from row cropping land is what they're talking about. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at the black bar carbon content so just getting us into pasture results in an average increase of about 3% more soil carbon. But then here are all of our offensive strategies. And this is what really plays into pasture renovation. So they found that increasing the legume population, improving the grazing management, reseeding with improved grass varieties, so meaning things that were, were you know, recently bred lines or had been cultivated for their performance, getting fertilization under control, all of these things further enhanced the annual carbon sequestration. And so again, just getting us into pasture, that's defense, but then how we manage it and then how we renovate it when it needs renovation, that's our offensive strategy for climate change. So there's another study that used one of these awesome climate models uh, to run a ton of different scenarios of pasture composition. So different species, different ratios of grass to legumes. And they looked at how all of these different compositions would respond under a variety of climate change conditions that are predicted for the Great Lakes region. And one of their big takeaways in terms of the profitability is they found that the percentage of legumes was the main factor, aside from the climate scenario itself, which is fair, that influenced the net return per cow over milk production. Um, this study also recommended that pastures maintain at least 30% legumes. In fact, um, in particular, they found, again, to echo what, what Al was saying, that pastures that had about 50% red clover and 50% ryegrass were predicted to be the most resilient under all climate scenarios. But our bottom floor is 30% legume composition. 
And this is good news because the recommendation is if you have about 30% legumes in your pasture, then you don't actually need to provide supplemental nitrogen fertility to them, which of course has uh, climate implications. So I could imagine this would be, you know, a great opportunity for some Aaliyah's tools to be able to assess what is your pasture composition. And if you're in the renovation game, you know, sometimes increasing your legume population is as simple as frost seeding. It's not, it's not a, a silver bullet, it's not always the most effective, but it can be really low hanging fruit. And so a takeaway here is that legumes are really an MVP in our pastures. Uh, so there's another study that found that increased fertility led to increased carbon stores in the soil. And if you remember, the pick is addressing our pH and our fertility as, as two of the first steps. So, um, so this particular study looked at phosphorus, sulfur, and I believe the third one was nitrogen. And overall, they found that essentially having the right amount of fertility meant more carbon in your soils. And the mechanism of this is pretty simple. You add fertility, you can support root growth. Roots are a huge part of that carbon sequestration process. Here's our offensive strategy. This also complements all of the effort that farmers put into having good grazing practices where we're trying to favor root growth. And so if you're grazing in order to favor and promote root growth, you wanna make sure you have the fertility to support the play that you're trying to run. So when you're thinking about renovating your pastures, I think it's really important to watch tape. And when you watch tape, you're trying to figure out what is the other team's plays, but also what are the inefficiencies in your own plays. And so you can think of this as looking at where have you left holes in your defense, but also what are your offensive strengths. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but this is things like what are your soil tests like? What are your weeds telling you? It's one thing to have weeds, but they're usually an indicator of things like low pH or low fertility or compaction. Um, you know, do you have the right stocking rate? And so when I go out and I visit a farm, here's the question I want to know. I want to know why is your grass, your dead grass dead, and why are your bald patches bald? So that when we get into a renovation scenario, we can try to patch up those holes in our defense and make sure this renovated system is going to continue to work for us the way that we want to moving forward. So you got to know the play, of course. So what's your renovation plan? So first, did you watch tape? Did you evaluate your records? Did you do your soil tests? Two, you got to set the pick. So you have to address that pH. It's one of the biggest things is what's your lime? What's your pH? Uh, you need about a year usually to get your uh, pH where it needs to be. Um, have you addressed your fertility needs, especially potassium and phosphorus? And have you managed those weeds through intensive grazing, herbicide, um, mowing to, to knock them back? And then once you set the pick, you got to roll to the basket and you have to remember that the play is not yet done. You might get to the basket and find that you're not open for the ball. And by that, I mean, you might find that you did the first steps and you still have to come in and do some more aggressive reseeding, whether it's overseeding or a no-till drill, whatever method you might need. And so the point here, though, is you've set yourself up to be able to do that. If you get the, to the point of needing to reseed, you've already done those initial steps of looking at your fertility, your weeds, your pH. So um, obviously this is not like a how-to extension talk today, but if you find yourself in the market for wanting a how-to, here are two fact sheets that I would recommend uh, at the bottom of the page. It'll walk you through the steps. So one more point that I wanna make about pasture renovation is we have to remember that once we establish new pasture, um, once we renovate, overseed, again, whatever we might do, we can't linger. So in basketball, you're not allowed to hang out in the paint. If you linger in the paint, you get a penalty. Same thing in new pasture. We have to give it time to establish and we have to, you know, to kind of take a bite and move. And this is really important because when we're trying to make these climate adjustments and we're trying to figure out whether as ag service providers or as farmers how to implement these methods, we have to find the time in the production schedule. So we have to go back to the, the fundamental feasibility of agricultural production. So um, last point here is when we're thinking about pasture renovation, I think about it as playing for legacy. It's not just the one game. It's not just the season. Investing in, a, in pasture renovation does have a cost. Uh, there, you know, there is a time investment. But if we put in those efforts, then we really have nice pastures that can combat and respond to climate change and help keep our farms active and profitable you know, for decades and generations to come. So that's, that's my piece.
That was delightful. Thanks so much, Sam. I learned a lot about pasture and about basketball and it was fun and engaging and really appreciate it. All right, I'd like to welcome um, conversation and, and questions from the community. I saw at least one question go by in the chat, so I can start with that, that question, um, but after that would open the floor. Oh, it looks like we had a couple questions actually. Um, one uh, is a question for Leah. It's, this is from Valerie. Uh, Valerie writes, people are starting to get paid for their carbon. Could you explain that further? You wanna jump in on what you know about sure. carbon payments at this point? Yeah, there's different companies that are starting to emerge that are starting to offer carbon credits. Um, a, it, it depends on which uh, company, depends on how they're sort of monitoring it. Um, and there's not really a consensus on like one way to measure carbon for carbon credits right now. Um, but some of these are Regen Network is one, Nori is one, um, gold standard is another, and all of them have different ways for you to get into their networks, whether it's project-based um, or individual farm-based or collective. It kind of depends on the, the, the organization itself. Great, thanks for that. Does anyone else want to um, weigh in on the, the topic of carbon credits or carbon markets or getting paid for carbon? All right. If not, um, I had a question for um, Al. You, you said that, um, and perhaps I misunderstood this, but it sounded like you or your model was predicting, um, I think it was a decrease in precipitation when most were projecting an increase. And I was curious um, why that was, or if you wanted to share a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay. The um, I guess there's a lot of variability among the different climate models that we mm -hmm. work with. Some of the models are pro projecting decreases. Most are projecting increases. Overall, the average is, is an increase in precipitation. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I may have misheard that. Um, looks like we've got another question from Heidi. You mentioned converting row annual, even no-till, to pasture stores about 24% more carbon. Do we know the comparison between well-managed pasture versus perennial fields that may get bush hogged once a year? That is an excellent question. The short answer is no. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, but I will, I will uh, answer your question with a caveat that won't answer your question at all. Um, so that particular study was, I believe, done in Brazil. And what we find when we, or what I find when I look at the literature and, and this, this carbon information is it's so relative to the particular climate and the soil type and, um, you know, other, you know, biotic and abiotic processes at play. So um, Al might know more about if, and if you've seen that in any of the modeling that he has done, but I do think that's a really good question and it's something I'm interested in looking into more because I think there's sort of an idea out there that if I just do pasture, that's good, and I'm all set. Um, but we know that poorly managed pasture can be environmental risks of non-point uh, source pollution, that they can have erosion, and that they can actually be worse than, than well-managed row crops. So it's a great question, but it's not one that I have the number for right now. Great. Anyone else um, want to weigh in on that question? Well, I mean, I, I don't know <laughs> if there's a more specific question, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of trade-offs, I guess, when you start comparing across systems. But I mean, there's a lot of positives for, for pasture and grazing. Um, as far as soil health and, and reduced of some reduction of some emissions and things, but some are increased too. And uh, yeah, it, it Unless there's something more specific, I guess I'll just leave it at that. All right. I, I can add that it's it, just like Al said, it gets really confusing when you look at methane emissions, especially from grazing animals versus animals in confinement and grazing animals on good pastures versus poor pastures and how much methane is emitted per kilogram of milk. 
all those things come into play and you have to be really careful when you're trying to evaluate the differences between systems. Yeah, I, I think that Rick makes a great point. And, and so when you, when you look at these studies also, um, some people do quantify how much emissions are produced you know, by the cows themselves and methane. Um, some people really get into the quantification of what was the, the carbon emissions from any supplemental fertility they added. And so you kind of get into this gross versus net question about what is the whole carbon of the whole system. And, um, and, it, and it's funny because for every study that says one thing, there's a study that seems to say the opposite. Uh, and, I, and I think as we have more tools and more on-farm soil health testing, I think it'll really help farmers be able to track their own progress. And maybe, like I'm really interested in what Leah's um, working on, maybe creating larger data sets so that we can compare in our own neighborhoods and get a sense of how well am I doing compared to my neighbors. Great. Um, thanks for weighing in. I think we'll go to the next question. This is for Al from Ellen. Do the model results you presented predict a change in year-to-year -year yield variability? Getting into the weeds here. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think in a general, I mean, both temperature and precipitation are becoming more variable and, and, and both of those affect crop yields, so yields, yes, are becoming more variable too. I mean, I showed some error bars around those projected changes in yield and things, and that's just the variability that's, that's coming about because of the different climate models projecting different things too, so. But, but yes, I think we can, be, we can be sure that overall, uh, there might be some benefit, particularly in pasture and forage yields, but also more variability. Great, thanks. And um, Al, the next question's for you as well. Uh, and Glenn asked if he could ask this verbally because it's a, a bit of a detailed question, I think. Go ahead, Glenn, if you want to chime in. Thanks, Sonia. Um, well, Dr. Rotz, you come highly recommended from Rick Herzberg and other people. Um, so I'm a tree fruit guy. I'm not a forage guy, but we've been pulling hourly weather data and forecasts and observations. We got all these goodies of solar and vapor pressure deficit. And I know that forage drying is a huge issue. So I've been looking at developing a, a generic relative forage drying model based on the, the weather forecast. And your 1985 paper, you and uh, Yi Chen, still seems 36 years later, still seems to be the uh, seminal paper on a model to do that. It's alfalfa, not mixed grasses. So I guess a couple of questions are, are there any updates to that model? And do you have any opinions about using a, an alfalfa based model as sort of a generic index for forage drying in general or anything else you got to say about running weather data through your model? And you must've been 12 when you did it because that's 36 years ago. Well, I was younger anyhow, yes. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not aware that and anybody else has followed up on that. And my career has kind of taken a different direction too, but uh, we're, we're using that model for grass as well as alfalfa. And I guess we feel it works um, pretty well, I guess for grass too. So um, yeah, it's probably the, the best thing available if you really wanted to try to predict um, drying rates of uh, grass or alfalfa crops. All right, that's good to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Splendid. Uh, the next question is for Leah. Does Leah have any results to share relative to animal diet effects on methane? You want to give a quick, quick update on that, Leah? Sure. From our study, we do not. Um, we're about halfway through it, so we have no results to report back. But there's been studies that have come out of UC Davis that they're using a different uh, species of seaweed than we are, but for theirs, there were uh, reductions in methane emissions. And I'd be happy to send out that paper as well. I guess I can comment on that some too. I mean, we, we hear a lot about the use of uh, seaweed and it, uh, it can have a, you know, 
a very major effect, at least short term, on reduction of methane. Uh, from a practical standpoint, I don't think seaweed's ever going to be a practical feed additive for, for dairy animals, but but uh, maybe the compounds within seaweed that are that are doing it um, might be helpful if we can isolate them and produce them in some way. But there's also some toxicity from that too, which is not necessarily good for the animal. <laughs> so. There's some trade-offs there. There are other compounds too um, that, that are being explored. Most of them aren't, aren't getting quite as effective results as a seaweed, but, but still uh, there's possibilities there. A lot of the things, a lot of things that have been tested haven't been done for like, let's say full lactation studies and over years uh, and that sort of thing. So we don't know a lot yet about long-term impacts. Good to know. Um, this next question from Emily is, uh, I would open up to anyone, and it's a question that I'm really curious about too. Uh, is there a plant slash weed identification app that includes a, what are your weeds telling about you, your pastures components? Does anyone know of such a thing? So there are a number of free plant apps. Um, I, and, and a farmer actually showed me up when I was at a farm visit and I didn't know what a weed was and she pulled out her phone and snapped a picture and it told us right then and there. Um, and I, and I think, I think that particular app was called Plant Snap. Um, and what, and I, and I, th some of them I think do give you some information, but I think, um, something to keep in mind is depending on the and and this is probably something that Leah can speak to way more knowledgeable than me, but um, some of these apps are, are still, you know, getting some refinements or development. And so if it's a common lookalike, um, you know, there could be misidentification. Um, but, you know, I think they're great because they can point you in the right direction. They can give you a little bit of information about, you know, typically found growing in like Pasture weeds I always come up as saying, typically found growing in disturbed pastures, roadsides, compacted areas, low pH, and you're like, okay, well, that's my pasture. Um, so yeah, the apps are out there. I also really recommend the book, Weeds of the Northeast. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's a great, you know, just like keep it in the truck kind of a, a book. Yeah, second thought book recommendation for sure. All right, friends, we've got Two minutes left, if anyone has a last totally burning question. And if not, we can give a round of applause to our distinguished panelists and thank you so much for today's really informative and wonderful session. Um, this session has been recorded and it'll get posted on our MECAN website soon. So folks who weren't able to join us live can tune in there. And we hope to see you all next time around. The next webinar in this series is happening two weeks from today and um, will be about water management uh, on farms in a changing climate. So see you all again soon. And thanks again, panel. <laughs>